Thank you so much to all of you for being here today and for taking part in our bi-monthly Bridge Book Club. Today we are, we are so lucky to be joined by author Mary Doria Russell and we are discussing the women of the Copper Country. Uh, my name is Amber DeLind and I am the membership director at Bridge Michigan. I am joined today uh, by my colleague Catherine Dougal who is the engagement and development special, specialist for the Center for Michigan, which is the nonprofit publishing organization of Bridge Michigan. If you are, like a few of our, our members that were joined today, were invited today by uh, friends or family members and aren't familiar with Bridge. Bridge is an online news organization. We are nonprofit, we're nonpartisan, and we focus our journalism on issues that face the people of Michigan. So all of the things that sort of you think about, things that, issues that face your community, that's what Bridge writes about. Um, we are free to read. You can visit uh, bridgemi.com and see all of our Bridge coverage there. Um, you can subscribe to our free email newsletters. There are many of you here who are Bridge members, which are people who donate uh, to Bridge uh, as a tax deductible nonprofit uh, because we are a nonprofit organization. Um, Bridge members get free a free copy of the book from Bridge, so something to think about for the future. But just letting you know more about Bridge, and you can check us out, like I say, at bridgemi.com. We are so lucky today, like I say, to be joined by author Dr. Mary Doria Russell. Um, I will give her an introduction in just one minute, but I just want to go over our schedule for the, for the afternoon so you know what to expect. Uh, we're going to start with a discussion uh, with Mary, some of the questions that we put together um, amongst our bridge staff. And then we're going to conclude with some questions that readers submitted. Because we had such a huge, big response to this book and this book club, we took questions in advance primarily, and we want to thank you, say thank you so much to those who sent questions in advance. We had uh, nearly 300 people register for this book club. So, so delighted and excited that, um, that you're all here joining this conversation. Uh, we are recording the discussions, and we'll be posting the the, the video of that recording tomorrow in Bridge. So if you wanted to watch again, or if you know someone who wanted to be here to this afternoon and wasn't able to join us, um, you can go ahead and send them that link and they'll be able to watch the conversation uh, whenever they would like. Uh, but without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, I would like to, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mary Doria Russell. Mary Doria Russell has been called one of the most versatile writers in American literature and one of our greatest contemporary storytellers. Her novels are studied in literature, theology and history courses in colleges and universities, and are often chose as book club and community read selections, much like this one. Russell was born in suburban Chicago. Her mother was a Navy nurse and her father was a Marine Corps drill sergeant. She studied cultural anthropology at the University of Illinois, social anthropology at Northeastern University in Boston, and received her doctorate in biological anthropology from the University of Michigan. Go blue. <laughs> I'll forgive it as a Spartan, but I love it. I'm so glad that you, that you went to school here. I didn't know that until I saw your yeah. biography. Um, Russell's first novel, The Sparrow, was chosen as one of the 10 best books of the year by Entertainment Weekly and won the Arthur C. Clarke Prize. The sequel, Children of God, won the Friends of the, Li of the Library USA's Reader's Choice Award. The San Francisco Chronicle called A Thread of Grace, hauntingly beautiful, and the novel was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Dreamers of the Day is one of the few novels about the Middle East praised in both Turkey and Israel. Doc, her fictional doc biography of Doc Holliday, was one of the Washington Post's three best novels of 2011, and its follow-on, Epitaph, examines the way the gunfight at the OK Corral became central to American mythology about the Old West. Her latest novel, The Women of the Copper Country, is about Annie Clements, the young union organizer who was once known as America's Joan of Arc. All that to say, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Mary. And we really appreciate you coming to talk about your fantastic book with us. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. We are delighted to have you here. Uh, so my first question for you, and it's one that you really covered a bit in the, the video that you were so kind to send to us uh, in advance, um, where you talked a little bit about sort of why you decided to write the women of the copper country. Um, but I wanted to focus for this Michigan-based audience um, on essentially like 
do you have any connection to the Upper Peninsula or the mining industry? And just wanted to know a little bit about your research practice process yeah. for Upper No, my, my husband uh, and his family went up to the UP in the summertime for years. I personally had no connection to it. Um, okay. I literally was watching PBS, you know, because I watch way too much television. And it was three o'clock in the afternoon and I was waiting for a four o'clock baseball game to start, seriously. Uh, and so I was kind of clicking around through the channels and came across a PBS documentary called Red Metal, which was about the 1913 copper strike in the, the UP. Um, and I had I could never known anything at all about it. I grew up in Chicago, so I'm not that far from uh, uh, the Upper Peninsula, but just didn't have any, any connection to it. Um, and I'm watching this documentary and I see Annie Clements, um, who was 25 years old uh, and out there in front of the daily strikers marches uh, for the, for the um, uh, Western Federation of Miners. And my first reaction to that was, what, wow, a woman a young woman out in front of this labor movement. How did that work? Um, and uh, she, and th the fact that she was literally head and shoulders above all of the people around her, that she was six feet three inches tall. Um, and uh, it just, it, it, she was such a striking figure. Um, and then of course the, the uh, documentary goes on and talks about um, James McNaughton who was the CEO of Calumet and Hecla and who swore from the very beginning that grass would grow in the streets of Calumet before he ever recognized the union. So the, the battle lines were drawn early and they were drawn firmly. And um, I thought, okay, so I've got like a good girl and a bad guy, right? <laughs> I can work with this. You know? And I had just <laughs> finished writing Epitaph and I really, I always believe that whatever book I last wrote was my last book, you know? Uh, it's, it's too hard. I'm not going to do this again. Um, so at that point, I just sent out a little blurb on, on Facebook saying, I just came across this documentary. I think there might be a story for me to tell here. And about 10 minutes later, I got an email from my friend Rivka, who said, my great grandfather, Solomon Christo, was the last man to die before the strike took place. Mm -hmm. And he was part of the reason for it. And at that point, I said, I, I need to take you to breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are so going to meet tomorrow. And uh, she met me there and had all this documentation about her family and the strike and what their, their, uh, their part was, because it was that the Cristo family was a central uh, part of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, I just said, okay, you know, it's the, the, the literary gods don't drop a story like that into your lap unless no you need to tell it. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how I got started. Uh, not a personal thing, uh, just uh, sure. uh, it became personal once I that's, began digging into it. Wow, that's, that's incredible. What a, yeah, what providence, honestly. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about sort of what your sources were? How'd you do your research for this story? Um, apart from, I, I did go up to the UP. I went, I spent time in Houghton and in, um, and in Calumet and went all the way up to Copper Harbor and, you know, toured the mines and asked a lot of questions, uh, went to the museums um, and uh, uh, generally did a lot of, of just like face to face, you know, uh, being able to walk through the streets in, um, in Calumet and seeing the houses, many of which are still there, the, uh, mm -hmm. um, the miners housing had to be strong and, uh, and lasting because my God, you know, if you get 15 feet of snow, oh <laughs> you can't get away with like two by fours, you got to build that house really strong. And okay. a lot of them are still there. Uh, the sandstone buildings of the downtown from the era when it was called the Paris of the North. Um, those are still there. You can still get a sense of how prosperous it used to be. 
uh, and being able to, to talk to people in the area also let me know that as with Rivka's family, uh, there, there was a split in how people reacted to the strike. And to this day, uh, there are people in Calumet who will say that Annie Clements ruined this town. Mm. Uh, you know, the strike drove the copper mines out of, out of our town and that's why it's half gone today. I don't argue mm -hmm. with people face to face because that scares me. But um, uh, nevertheless, I had also done a lot of work uh, in, in Arizona on the silver mine beneath the town of Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, okay. Again, hard rock, uh, capital intensive mining that needed a lot of uh, infrastructure. And I toured the Bisbee copper mine, which is only about 25 miles away. And in Bisbee, it's a, it's a surface mine. You just set the charges and blow shit up sure. and then you go pick up the ore and it's much 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 cheaper than having to go down a mile and a half to the remaining copper uh sure. deposits underneath calumet so you know win lose or draw that th those mines were going to be shut down it was just too expensive to try and exploit them at that point any extractive industry like that is going to run out of what you're extracting before too long goes by so. certainly very interesting. Wow. Uh, this next question that I have for you is, is, is kind of about some of, some of the structure within the book. So I, I noticed, as I'm sure many of our readers did, the Romeo and Juliet quotes at the beginning of each chapter. And for me, I thought as a reader, I thought it nicely set up this sort of dynamic between the miners and the mine owners, kind of the opposing sides like the Montagues and Capulets. Yeah, is that two households, to... both alike in dignity. Yes. Precisely. <laughs> Management and labor. Get it? <laughs> Is that why you chose to include yeah. those quotes? Yeah, yeah. Also, because um, when you when you really take a dive into Romeo and Juliet, um, people think of it as a, a, a love story, and certainly there there are several doomed love uh, relationships in uh, the women of the Copper Country. Um, but um, at its base, Romeo and Juliet is about wealth about who creates it and about who gets to control it, who keeps it. Mm. And that's basically what the book is about. Who creates the wealth? Is it the capital that came in and did the, um, uh, uh, the infrastructure or is it the, the laborers who go down every day and bring the ore up? Well, you know, that's an interesting question to, to put side by side. And so um, uh, if you think of um, the, uh, Romeo and Juliet, her father basically owns Juliet. She's a 13-year-old girl. She hasn't even turned 14 yet. Right. And um, she, uh, she is put on display at this big party at the beginning of the, of the story. Um, and for all practical purposes, daddy is taking bids, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And when, when he picks out an aristocrat for her to marry, um, and she says, but daddy, I'd really rather not marry that person. It's just, he's, he has the same reaction that, um, that James McNaughton had, which is to say, beg, steal, die in the streets. You know, <laughs> I'll sure. never acknowledge thee. That's the same as grass will grow in the streets of Calumet before I acknowledge the union. So there were just, as I, as I wrote chapter by chapter, um, the, uh, the, the lines from the play just leapt out and became it, it became obvious and I got all the way to the end of the of the book and even then uh there were echoes with the uh with the story for example and this is one time where the 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 play actually solved a problem for me in the book uh at the end when you find out that McNaughton has now sent out goons to to kill or arrest or drive out of town union officials um, and we have Annie and, and Michael Sweeney who need to meet, right. but are, if, if either one of them is seen on, on the streets, they're likely to be arrested. Mm -hmm. And I had the priest bring them together. Nice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was like, that. oh my God, how am I going to sell this? I don't know. And then, then I, I watched the, the play again and went, there it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. I 
loved it. I thought it was such a cool, it was such a cool connection. And, you know, I had never thought about Romeo and Juliet truly in that way, that it was yeah. really yeah. story and about, you know, power and who creates wealth, like you say. Right. And, and children die at the end. You know, That's, you've got right. a 14 year old and a 17 year old who die. That is true. Parents have said it won't compromise in any way. So right. yeah, it's it's uh, it was a very easy to me. It mapped one for one, but that seems to be something that escapes a lot of people. Like, why did you do that? <laughs> I liked. It. I thought it was. <laughs> um, speaking of sort of reader reaction, so oh. one of the things clearly this story really resonates with a lot of people. I mean, I think you know, obviously, a, a Michigan audience might be particularly interested in this book, but this is the the biggest reaction we've had to a Bridge Book Club. Um, so far, we've had nearly 300 people register for the wow. for this discussion. So do readers' reactions to this story surprise you? And that's kind of part one of my question. And the second is, why do you think that this story or the story of Annie Clements isn't more well known in Michigan and beyond? Well, um, at the, at the, I'll answer the second question first, because I have no short term memory anymore. So you'll have to remind me of what the first one is. Sure, happy to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the uh, at the end of the book, uh, I tried to explain that the the strike ends in April of 1914, mm -hmm. and by August, it's war in Europe. Right. And so it just gets. I mean, we've just lived through four years where the most astonishing things happen, and they're gone by that afternoon. That's because true. there's just this tsunami of additional news all the time. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's one reason. Partially also, it's because many of the of the people on the union side were either killed or run out of town or left and, and didn't deal with it anymore. Annie Clements, for example, moved to Chicago in April of that year. Okay. Uh, and uh, she was already pregnant uh, and uh, married in Chicago, her second husband. Um, whoop, I just, somebody's, I just have a no, says no camera. Am I still here? I'm still here for you. Sorry, I can still see you. There yep. you are. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. This is like a seance, right? Can you hear me? <laughs> Elizabeth, are you there? Can you hear me? Um, uh, yeah. So anyway, um, Annie herself uh, moved to Chicago. Uh, in real life, she did not have a great second husband. I gave her a very nice guy to marry. You know, Michael Sweeney was a terrific guy. I, I posthumously gave her the gift of a decent relationship. But in real life, um, she is what my, my mother-in-law used to call a bad picker. Mm. And uh, she married three times. They all turned out to be violent drunks. Uh, and she divorced every single one of them, but you know it was sure. it was not a happy uh, um, marital uh, arrangement for her. None of them were. Uh, she started her own millinery uh, um, uh, shop. She made hats. She repaired hats, um, and she treated her own workers well. But she never talked about the the strike, and never talked about the Italian Hall, and never said anything to her own family about what her part in it was. Uh, so it, she kind of just drops off of the radar, partially because the story was overwhelmed by larger history, but also because she wanted nothing more to do with it. And I think that has a great deal to do with feeling responsible for the Italian Hall disaster. I mean, sure. It was her idea to give the party. Sure. So that's one of those things where she felt responsible. She was not culpable. She didn't do anything wrong. No, of course not. But yeah. she just walked away. So, sure. and the first part of the question? <laughs> well, I guess it, because uh, sort of the events themselves are not very well known, did, do readers' responses, your, your, kind of how popular this book is, did that re surprise you at all? Uh, you know, it has been surprising to me. I mean, this was uh, something where I was telling a story that, that had dead kids at the end of it. <laughs> like, you know, that's going to be a big hit. Um, uh, the, the publishing industry was not, did not snap it up. Uh, large numbers of publishers said, I don't think so. Thanks all the same. Um, but uh, once it got into publication, I have been really surprised by how strong and how positive the reaction is. Uh, just dumb luck. Um, it, it, 
the idea of women activists is uh, once again, we women activists have to rise to the to the front of the parade. And that had, you know, I, I finished writing this book literally four years ago. Wow. Okay, so about a, about a week before the last presidential election, when everybody thought Hillary was going to win, including Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, suddenly, I'm faced with the question that that Moshe Glass asks in the book, the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish shopkeeper who gives credit to the, uh, to the strikers during the, during the strike, uh, who is a real person, by the way. Moshe Glass is real. Um, and, uh, and, and he says, what do you do when you lose? You know, he's, he's been through a lot in his life. And he says, you have to have another plan because this is, you know, no matter how passionate you are, no matter how much you expected to win, you have to know what you're going to do if you lose. That's a question for us to answer today as well. Uh, and uh, so I think that it, it dumb luck, it, it, uh, it fits the political moment that we've lived through. Okay. Uh, and it gives a sort of historical context for uh, how, what went into um, gaining an eight hour day and a five day week and uh, safe working conditions and uh, uh, access to medical care and all of these things that the union movement uh, fought for, people died for uh, to make better lives for the, for the workers who came after them. And that's all in danger. And uh, so I think that th that, that sense of um, the immediacy of it was unexpected, but it it's why I think that uh, people have responded so strongly to it. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I just have a few more questions that sort of we put together as a bridge team, and then I'll switch to some questions from bridge readers. Um, one question that I have just for point of sort of fact, because I don't know this, was the ownership of the town by Calumet, yes. was that typical for other yes. mining towns? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for example, uh, the same kind of thing uh, was true in the coal companies uh, in West mm -hmm. Virginia and and in uh, and out west as well. The uh, like I say, the um, especially hard rock mining. It's so capital intensive uh, that uh, you basically the corporations come in and they buy up the deposit and then they make uh, um, housing available to people who who work there. Uh, but when I was a kid, I mean, I'm really little, uh, there was a Tennessee Ernie Ford uh, um, song called 16 Tons. You load mm -hmm. 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. That's, that was what kept people working is that they had, they owed everything to the company store. They were basically, it was literally slave wages. You were paid just enough to match what a plantation owner would pay enslaved people on a plantation. You got enough for some clothes and you, you had enough, you had to pay for your own tools mm -hmm. and you had to pay for your own uh, uh, food. And all of that was coming right out of the salary. So at the end of the month, you had nothing. You were, you were deeper in debt. Calumet and Heckler was really interesting because they were kind of the most liberal in that they gave, they had decent housing, as Mother Jones says, you know, if, if the housing weren't good, you know, they'd freeze to death every winter. So and the housing no was the kind work. of not exactly out of the goodness of their corporate hearts. It was to keep people from freezing to death so they'd go back to work the next day. Um, but uh, it, they also had uh, schools, again, nice schools that prepared the students to go to work either underground or on the, for the company. Mm -hmm. um, so everything was geared towards uh, maximizing profits okay. and minimizing uh, uh, expenditures. Um, and you see that in what was actually the central issue of the strike, which was bringing in the one man drill. Mm -hmm. Prior to the strike, uh, you had teams of two men who would run these gigantic drills. And if, if there was a cave in, if uh, you, you lost light, any, any kind of emergency, you had two people, one of whom might be able to pull the other one out or go for help. With sure. the one man drill, it was a 150 pound rig and you worked by yourself. 
and it, it was much harder, it was much more dangerous. But from McNaughton's point of view, automation would cut his underground workforce in half. And that chops a big percentage of his uh, corporate outlay off mm -hmm. and, and, and squeezes a little bit more profit out of what's left of the copper deposits in the UP. So, you know, automation is not new. <laughs> We've been, sure. been dealing with this for a long time. Certainly, certainly. Very interesting. I, that's very good to have that context to sort of understand that relationship. Um, one thing that I sort of speaking of, of the mind ownership as a reader, I really enjoyed the way that you sort of bookended McNaughton's routine in this, you know, the first chapter you sort of describe his down to the minute uh, morning routine. He's totally in control. Oh my totally gosh. Totally in control. Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially with the help of his household staff, you know, they're the ones who sort of keep the, you know, they, they abide by that schedule and make it possible. And then at the end, your description of sort of how hapless and, and chaotic his, his morning is um, after his staff. Yeah, I, w I wish I could tell you that I did that on purpose. but <laughs> I loved it. I was like, <laughs> oh, she's right. It, it does work that way. I, I really didn't think of that. Yeah, I, I did want him. Uh, what I figured was by, by that time, his whole, the, his illusion of control would be undermined completely. I mean, people are, the, the people who run his household have walked out. His wife hasn't left him, but she's not living there anymore. You know, she's right. in Europe spending money with his girls. Um, and uh, uh, he, he looks out over the, uh, the, the town that he used to think he controlled entirely and realizes that nobody's working, that there's been this disaster and it's, it's, his whole life has been thrown into chaos. Uh, so the illusion of control uh, is what I was going for, but I had I hadn't really noticed that it was like his more description of two mornings. I was like two house. That's actually good too. Right, there two it is <laughs> one with servants and the other without. You know. No kidding. That's true. I did. <laughs> Were there any other callbacks or character arcs that you that you particularly were pleased to to have in this story? Um, you know, I, I I was happy with how I was able to end it. Um, I rewrote the end after after the last election, when okay. dealing with defeat was more of a a, a, a live issue. Um, and I liked that I was finally able to 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 shift the focus from Annie, the prior generation, you mm -hmm. know, to, uh, to Ava Savicki. And she is only 15 when it ends, but she spent her 14, uh, the, 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 well, I guess it's her 15th year, learning from all of these titans of the labor movement, you know, from sure. Mother Jones and Ella Bloor, and, and to be able to, to remind people who are alive today of the not just the contribution but the um you know these were the the ruth bader ginsburgs of their time they were powerhouse um labor organizers and political forces and we can like ava we can call back to the people who have come before us and say all right they they experience defeats too what do mm -hmm. you do when you lose you don't just walk away and say i give up sure. you, know, you you find another fight you organize better this time. You um, you take heart from the idea that you, that that groups of people can do more than a single individual by themselves, uh, and you find a different way, maybe even a different venue, to put your energy and your ideals to work. Uh, so I I really liked being able to have her letter to Jane Adams in Chicago, uh, sort of sum up what the book was about. I thought that was really, as a reader, I, you know, you just read about the horror of I know. <laughs> disaster and it just leads you can't to end with dead kids. You just, you, right. you, you can't end. Yeah. It right. let, for me, it gave me sort of a, a sense of, okay, well, there is a, there's future, you know? Yes. And so yeah, I, it took until the 1930s to get a lot of the legislation passed. Uh, so that's, that's decades. Right. You know, you don't always get what you want when you think it up. Sure. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the labor unions had been working for decades before 1913. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's important to realize that these things, that there will be resistance. 
There will sure. be corporate clawbacks. There will be the, the a relentless effort by people who have to not share what they've got. Sure. And, um, and to blame you because you don't have it. <laughs> Watch it. You, you obviously didn't try hard enough to be born to a rich father. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, let me transition now to some questions from readers. So we got uh, we got uh, some really great questions from readers, and the one that um, that we got in advance, but I also see in the in the chat right now um, is something that I mean we're busy casting casting the movie, which is very exciting. A uh, reader named Jacqueline asked, "Do you think this story would make an engaging movie?" It seems like quite a few of the people on this chat think so. So tell us a little bit about. Okay, I well, all right. If everybody would like to to write to Gwendolyn Christie. That's exactly who was right? chosen right? here. In yes, the chat. exactly. Okay, for those of you who've watched a Game of Thrones, Gwendolyn Christie played. She's she is in fact the same size as uh, Annie Clements. She is six three, uh, and when you put the pictures side by side, the resemblance is striking. They are both quite beautiful women, uh, but also physically imposing in a way that um, certainly Annie was surrounded by. Uh, underfed, undernourished um, uh, immigrants who barely came up to her shoulders most of the time. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think that, it, that she was, uh, Gwendolyn Christie was born to play <laughs> Annie Clements. So feel free to get in touch. She's on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> All right. Get her pictures of the book and tell her she should definitely uh, be in this movie. She should uh, option the book and, and get this film made. So yeah, I would love to see it done. Yeah. Well, you heard it here first, Bridge Readers. So there's a you have an opportunity <laughs> to make this happen. We can start it. We can start an online campaign. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be. I would love to see a, a movie yeah. version of this film, yeah. and I think she would be fantastic. She would, wouldn't she? Yeah, exactly. She really would. So this uh, next question is is um, about the Italian Hall disaster. So Layla asks, um, could you describe your thought process and decisions? when writing about the it Italian Hall disaster's chain of events. So some historians, historians contend that an anti-union person yelled fire deliberately. Others say people held the exit door shut, but she thought that your recounting of the event um, really captured the uncertainty of the event, leaving some room for interpretation. She grew up in the Copper Country, so she knew about the history and was just wondering how about, she was really wondering how you'd write about the disaster. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of your decision I to how yeah, to I, I knew that the, the reality was that people weren't certain. You had, I mean, the, there were a lot of people in Italian Hall who testified. I saw a man wearing a dark coat and a citizen's action button on the coat. I saw it very clearly. And there were about 13 people who testified to that. Now hmm. you have 800 people crammed into this space. So a lot of them didn't see that. So you just bring people up who were at the back of the room and they, they have to testify, no, I didn't see that. Well, you weren't in a position to see it. So I sure. knew that that was what was testified to. I also knew that there has never been a clear answer. There have been, I believe, three men who later um, uh, confessed to being the man who, who yelled fire. Now, cops will tell you that sometimes people will that they'll, they'll confess to things they didn't do and who knows why but sure that, that that's a psychology that exists so what i wanted to do was uh come up with a solution for who came to the top somebody came to the top of those stairs and yelled fire somebody did mm -hmm. uh and so what i wanted to do was to kind of bracket the possibilities there that maybe it was some ass pardon me some jerk who uh who, who just decided to come up and and be a jerk sure. or maybe it was somebody who like this guy was drunk and was talking about something else like he got fired for, mm -hmm. for, for <laughs> being a thief um you know uh and all of these things were possibilities and i wanted to bracket those so yeah I, okay. I, I was i was pretty happy with that solution um because it doesn't make me come down now as far as the doors come again there's there are different differing testimony. But the thing is, whether the doors were open or shut, I suspect they would have been shut primarily because it was cold. Cold, it was winter. Right? So no matter how they opened, in or out, it was cold, so they would have been shut. You have 22 stairs mm. and you have panic. 
and little right. kids little, little kids who are not you know if you've got a three-year-old he's not real good at going downstairs anyway sure. uh, all it takes is one child to trip and then another child to trip over that child and then another and another and another and by the time the the uh, uh the firemen are there for this fire uh the whole uh um the whole way up to the top is just jammed with children and, and uh, so yeah uh i whenever there is something like that where uh, it's it's not a clear fact that i can latch onto i try to come up with a literary solution that that will bracket the possibilities and that's what what i did Sure. That was, it, I, as the, this reader notes that she thought that it was just, it was really handled very well, considering that it's, you know, kind of a continued point of controversy. Yes, yeah, people, like I said, this is a live issue in, in Calumet to, these, to this day. People have opinions about it, so. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so an, a reader named Jacqueline asks, um, and you mentioned this, there was an infamous strike in Bisbee as well, a rival of Calumet. Were, were women involved in that strike as well? I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I went deep on Calumet. Right. Not become a mining history uh, Fair enough. A, a, a expert. Um, I know that there were a lot of strikes because, in general, uh, miners were considered livestock. You mm -hmm. know, you just you use them, and when they break, you throw them away or you shoot them or whatever. Uh, so um, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, it, it, that said, certainly in uh, the West Virginia mines. The women are critical to being able to keep going because if you have a, a, a wife and kids and your wife is telling you the kids are starving, you have to give up, that's gonna be really hard to say no to. If your wife sure. is behind you saying, I can stretch this a little bit further, we've got some stale bread I can add to this, you know, this mm -hmm. stew or whatever, th then there's that much more if you've got your family behind you it makes a big difference and i thought it was really important also to show how many things that the wives of even you know this is a completely male uh industry uh how many things the wives did that made it possible the uh the clothing banks the food banks the um uh uh keeping uh things going with parties and picnics and and uh uh, musical evenings and all of that sort of thing to keep morale going. Uh, those are really important and they're very rarely uh, acknowledged in in histories of, of these kinds of uh, movements. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Um, Jacqueline also asked, and you've touched on this, um, about sort of Annie, Cle Annie Clements's life after this. So I know you mentioned that she she moved to Chicago. She had her own her own store. Treated her her workers well. Is there anything else about her her life that you learned through your research that this group might find interesting? One thing I see in the comments is um, people are curious about whether you knew if because um, uh, Clover well, Char, you can ask me about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, all right, we did. Uh, I have one of the great things about Facebook. I mean, mostly I hate Facebook, but one of the great things about it is that I have 30,000 people on my page, right? Mm -hmm. And I can go out and say, do I have anybody who knows anything about fill in the blank, including sure. yesterday, uh, uh, leaf galls on a tree that we have. Anyway, and, and they came <laughs> up with it. It's a wonderful resource. So um, I asked about three books ago, uh, do I have anybody who does genealogy? And four or five people came forward and said, yeah, I, I, I do it. I'm an amateur. I do it. I'm a pro, you know, and, and they said, what do you need? So uh, I've worked with them several times. And for this one, I said, OK, we got a Klobuchar here. Mm -hmm. Can we find out if she's like in any way related to, to the governor? What we found out, they traced the two families back into the 1850s and didn't find any place where they crisscrossed. OK. And also, so no no uh, connection that we know of. Mm -hmm. um, Klobuchar, it turns out, is one of those names uh, for, a, our, um, for a profession. So like carpenter or miller okay. or something like Klobuchar mm -hmm. means uh, hat maker, mm. which is kind of cool because she ended up making hats, you know, but right. <laughs> part of a dumb luck. Uh, so anyway, yeah, Klobuchar is a, it, it doesn't indicate so much a lineage as it does uh, somebody in the last 200 years was a hat maker. I see. Okay, very interesting. Um, another kind of 
character driven question. This comes from Lynn. Lynn asks, I'd like to know how much of James McNaughton's character was based on actual research and account fiction. She asks, could he really have been that off? He was. Yes, he was. <laughs> All right. Th this is the closest I've written seven books. Okay. I don't know how it's, it's, it's a lot of pages. Okay. Right. Um, like say, I don't know how many pages, 30,000. Anyway, um, I have never written a straight up villain mm -hmm. until James McNaughton. And I, you know, I, I, I don't like to make somebody that one dimensional, but from his point of view, he, what his, his loyalty and his duty was to run that company for its shareholders, which is standard operating procedure for corporations. It's only the last year or two that we've started to hear some people talking about, well, maybe there's kind of a societal aspect to what we do as well. Um, but for a long, long time, what you were working for was your shareholders and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so in his mind, like in the mind of Juliet's father, He's doing the right thing and it's his duty and it's his responsibility to make these decisions. So either whether you're selling off your 13 year old daughter or you're, you're crushing uh, any labor movement, you're working for this larger group that's in your mind. Now, McNaughton uh, did a lot of, he was called in to testify before Congress after the, the strike. And so a lot of what I have for him are quotes Mm -hmm. um, he's well documented, so uh, it was just a matter of I I couldn't find anything to soften him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. With Joe Clements, I was able to soften Joe. Mm -hmm. He was big. He was violent. He was a drunk, and he did beat her. Mm -hmm. But at least with him, I was able to have Annie recognize that he has had, you know, if he had had a better life, he might be a better man. Sure. And. Uh, for a guy in 1913, I mean, it's not so easy for a lot of guys even today to accept that their wife is in a position of influence and people mm -hmm. are paying attention to her. And, uh, you know, and, and so being able to write a, a, a whole chapter from Joe's point of view, saying, you know, she's, she has no idea how hard my life is. She, she wouldn't last 10 minutes underground. And he, he's able to, to articulate why um, his why he's angry, sure. why this feels unfair to him, why he's threatened. Uh, but McNaughton never felt threatened. Mm -hmm. you know? Not until the very last morning that I, right. <laughs> everybody in his house has left him to burn his, his oatmeal. oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> My oatmeal burned. Oh, yeah. oh man. I was like, Talk about privilege, no, huh? right, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Um, so Natalie asks, and this is a, another thing that's kind of coming up in the in the comments here on the Zoom. You know, you've written sort of so many different genres. You've written about so many different subjects. When you're trying to decide sort of what comes next for you, how do you know what idea, research, or story to pursue into a novel? Like, how do you? How um, you don't. It's 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 a crapshoot. It really is. Um, I just finished a novel that I was quite pleased with that apparently can't get a publisher. Mm. So, you know, I, I spent three years on it and, uh, and nobody wants it. So, okay. Um, I, I don't know. And God knows I, if I thought I was writing to a market, my mm -hmm. books would not be the same. I, I read to learn and I write to understand. So, I, I have come across a number of things where I just, I didn't understand something. And I, sure. I, I often am coming from some place like uh, something that I learned in fourth grade, you know, about American mm -hmm. history or about world history or something like that. And I, I, as an adult, I'll stumble across something and say, wait a minute, like, how did that work? You know? Um, so for example, with the sparrow, uh, I had, I, I went to Catholic school when I was a kid and the early explorers and missionaries and, you know, they, they were heroes. And it wasn't until 1992, which was the 500th anniversary of Columbus landing in the, what we like to call the new world, uh, that um, suddenly people were saying, you know, if somebody breaks into your apartment and 
and, and takes your television, they didn't discover it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they stole it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, wait. <laughs> That's a whole different way of looking at this. Uh, and so once I have a, there's a startlement like that, then I begin to reconsider things. Uh, when you look at uh, the, uh, the story, the uh, epitaph, which was about the gunfight at the OK Corral, you know, you look at that now and you think that's actually an officer involved shooting of unarmed civilians. Hmm. You know, uh, and then finding out uh, as I did the research that, you know, in, if you watch the movies, um, it, it's always like the lawman of, against the cattle thieves. Sure. And as I demonstrated in the book, cows had nothing to do with this. <laughs> this was the, the, the gunfight of the OK Corral had nothing to do with cattle in any way. It was about gun control. Mm. And that's something that nobody wanted to face up to. Sure. So, you know, it's I, I get interested in things like that. And then, you know, I, I write the book and it's like you're throwing the dice again with every book. Uh, and that would be the case even if I stuck with like a series and I had like a whole bunch of the same characters. Mm -hmm. as many uh, uh, mystery writers do, because you do get to the point where your readership falls off a cliff because you so, people start to see the pattern. Sure. Like, oh God, that's another formula thing. And it's a, so, you know, you can either fall off a cliff because nobody was interested in something that you thought was interesting, or you can fall off a cliff because you're doing it again. And <laughs> if they've, you've, they've chewed the taste out of your, out of your gum, your uh, uh, gum, you know, so. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's always, it's always a crapshoot. I can imagine. Wow. I, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> Interesting. Um, what people are, the readers want to know sort of what you're working on now. Uh, enjoying old age with my husband. Fantastic. Like I said, I just finished a book nobody wants. Right. So it's, it's, it'll, it'll be a while before I, I decide that's a good game to play again. So. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm going to say that there is a Mary Doria Russell archive at Boston University. I'm going to send it in there with a, you know, wrapped up saying unpublished novel that ended her career, you know, and maybe some <laughs> graduate student 50 years from now will discover it and say, well, that wasn't that bad. Why didn't they want that? So. <laughs> well, hopefully someone will, will, will get, uh, get themselves together and see that and see its potential because I know no, I, I've, I've pulled it. I've pulled it. I've just said, Fair you know, uh, everybody agreed. I, I had like my my usual team of amateur readers mm -hmm. who read chapter by chapter for me and then my the pros in New York. And all of them had the same reaction, which was that the two storylines didn't pull together. It was too political. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of things they liked about it, but they didn't like how it ended and they wanted me to rewrite the last half. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just don't have it in me to rewrite. I was happy with how I ended it. I thought it was as strong as anything I've ever written. And um, all, of the, all of the proposed fixes for what they thought was wrong with it struck me as either uh, weaker or artificial or just, I just, I just didn't have it in me to, to start over again with that Fair enough. writing. So uh, quite happily after, you know, my husband and I just had our 50th anniversary. Congratulations. And, uh, you know, we're like, this is the season of harvest now. Uh, we have, uh, we, we worked for a long, long time and now we can sit back and enjoy the, the fruits of our labor. Absolutely, congratulations to the two of you. Thank you. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. I see that there are, there are actually quite a few questions that came in over the over the chat, but if you wouldn't mind taking one or two sure. additional. Yeah. Um, related to uh, the, um, sorry, related to Women of the Copper Country, Margot asks, um, she's curious about what you did your dissertation on in bioanthropology and how your background in anthropology sort of relates to your construction of this novel. <laughs> Okay, my, my doctoral thesis in biological anthropology was an engineering analysis of the craniofacial skeletons of the Neanderthals. Oh, okay, well, very connected. I I'll say it. that again slower for those of you who really want to look it up. <laughs> I got ten, tens of, re, of, of uh, reprint requests. On that. Um, yeah, uh, it, it relates to what I uh, have done for the last 25 years, only in that uh, 
uh, being a PhD in anthropology gets you used to spending years of your life on topics that only 11 other people in the planet give a damn about. <laughs> so, you know, my feeling was if I go from like 11 to just a few friends, it's not like I've dropped that far. You know, I, I haven't really lost a lot of readership if I could just go from 11 down to eight friends or something like that. So um, no one is more surprised than I by the reaction to the novels that I've written over the last 25 years. Uh, it has been a good run and, uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. It was kind of, I backed into this as I'm not one of those people who said, I want to be a writer when I grew up. Sure. Uh, it's, I wanted to be an anthropologist and I was, you know. Right. <laughs> so, until my entire department was downsized out of existence and um you know you've got to look for work Absolutely. so <laughs> well we're i think all of us on behalf of uh, all of the readers on this call we can say we're glad that you found this because it's <laughs> Really enjoy your work. Um, this is one just sort of little, very uh, Michigan related question. Um, they, this reader wanted to know um, how people in other countries decided to go to Calumet. Did they not hear about the about the hard winters? Uh, no, it, Calumet had a good reputation. Okay. You know, uh, and so people who were uh, who were in mining uh, tended to go there. That, that would be the the earlier immigrants from Cornwall. And, uh, and Wales and all these, uh, you know, the places where there was a, a, a very deep history of family um, mining. And in a lot of ways, you see that in West Virginia, even today, uh, that, you know, generation after generation, this is what people do. And they take a lot of pride in the danger and in how hard the work is. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's what you do. Um, I think that uh, when people were coming in from uh, Eastern Europe and, uh, from uh, Italy and you know from uh, from Finland, a lot of Finns, a lot of Finns. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, ordinarily, what happens with any immigrant group is that uh, you know there's somebody stumbles onto it and then writes home and mm. says, you know, there's there's work mm -hmm. here. Uh, and then a cousin comes and a brother comes and like that. And it's it's a <laughs> chain immigration works sure. for a lot of us for a long time. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I think that that's what happened, that you'd have people who stumbled onto it and then uh, mm -hmm. sent, sent uh, word back. That makes sense, makes yeah. sense. Um, I, we're, we're running up close to one o'clock and we, we're just really grateful for the time you've spent with us. Is there anything else that you were hoping that we'd ask today or anything you wanted to mention before I close us out? Buy the book. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. If you buy have, from you have an independent yet. bookstore, if you can. <laughs> absolutely, and um, and other books as well. Your other books yes, well. exactly. Um, then the other thing I would recommend is that when the uh, uh, when the announcement of this event went out, there mm -hmm. is a link to a, uh, a a fifteen minute video that my husband and I put together, um, in which I talk slower. <laughs> Can you tell I'm from Chicago because I sound like a machine gun? Uh, <laughs> I talk slower and there are also, um, it's, it's illustrated with pictures of everybody and you know, there's one wonderful picture of Annie where she's, you know, clearly the, the, how tall she was comes through. Uh, pictures of McNaughton, pictures of what it was like to work underground there. And uh, uh, I recommend that you, that you click on that link and, and give it a listen. Absolutely. I, I really enjoyed it. It helped me prepare for this conversation, but also it's just fascinating, especially after reading the book. So thank you for sending that over to us. All right. Well, it is it is nearly one o'clock. So I just I, I think I'll, I'll wrap us up for the afternoon. Mary, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and for for this story. We're just we're really grateful for you, your willingness to, to join the Bridge Book Club. Um, I also want to say thank you to all of the participants today. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. Um, just a heads up, this is nor obviously you may know that Bridge Book Club is normally every other month. Um, that would bring us to December. Um, and since we'd be butting right up to the holidays, we've decided that we're going to hold our next Bridge Book Club to January. So um, if you take Keep, uh, keep your eye on your, uh, your bridge uh, newsletters because we'll be sending out a little bridge post where we'll have a survey asking for um, ideas for our next uh, bridge book club book. So if you have any Michigan focused books that, you, uh, that you'd like to, to recommend, keep that in mind because we'd love to hear from you. We will be posting the recording of this discussion in Bridge tomorrow. So if, again, if you know anyone who wanted to see this, but were, 
weren't able to join us today, feel free to, to send them that recording once we have it posted in Bridge. Um, once again, uh, thank you for, for being here and I hope that you all have a lovely day. Thank you for joining the Bridge Book Club and we'll talk with you all again soon. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.